Good morning, Gateway Church. It's great to be back worshiping with you. Uh, as we begin this morning, I want to say a special thank you to all those that um, helped to move the snow this week. Special thanks to Alan Akers who came and plowed um, in the off hours and all those that came during the day and helped to shovel. And you snowblowers, we're grateful to those that came from Redeeming Grace Fellowship and helped us as well. Uh, God is good and our parking lot is for the most part open and we're grateful for that. This next month for Gateway Church is going to be a month of incredible importance. As you know that we've been taking the opportunity to take a look at Caleb Bunch as the new senior pastor of our church and to speak about a merger of the two congregations. Uh, we are going to be making those decisions in the month ahead. And as a matter of fact, our business meeting to vote on that is scheduled for one month from today. And so today, there will be information going out, both online and on the table in the back, that will um, let you know the outline of what's happening and the information of what we're happening in what is being presented to you by the leadership team for the receiving and the voting on Caleb Bunch as the senior pastor of the church. We've been asked by the um, assessment team to um, operate under a model of during large decisions like this, where we hold the discussion and the debate at one meeting, and then we vote up and down. And so in the February 17th business meeting, we're going to be having our discussion with respect to the merger and the calling of Pastor Caleb Bunch to the senior pastor of the church. Uh, then we're going to be closing that discussion with a motion to end the discussion and to vote up or down on March 7th, following the morning service on Sunday morning. It'll be by a private ballot, and so we'll be doing it that way. But please keep posted, follow the information. Today we'll be going out information about the merger and about the calling of Pastor Caleb. Uh, then also um, there'll be an additional information about details about the merger and things coming out in the reports for the business meeting. And so pay attention. Don't be afraid to contact your leadership team if you have any questions that need to be answered. Our midweek prayer meeting is going to be held this week at 7 o'clock here at the church. We also meet via Zoom, and we've ironed out some of the problems with the sound uh, of integrating these two meetings together. So please join us either in person or make sure that we have your email address so that we can send you an invitation to the Zoom portion. Sunday morning prayer meets in the back of the church in the entranceway at 9.15 each Sunday morning. Thank you so much for your faithful support. We need you. We need your gifts and your giving. Um, there is an offering box in the back of the church that is our regular way. We will not be passing the plate for the foreseeable future. Um, go to the church website. At the top of the website, you can hit the word give, and it will walk you through how you can give online. You can also use, as many have done, your bank's bill pay option, and we're grateful for those of you that have been faithful in that way. And you can also just mail us a check here at 50 Walcott Road, Levittown, New York, 11756. Thank you for being a part of this time and season of getting to know Pastor Caleb. Um, we have now had three months of um, sharing with him, both in lunches at his home, here on Sunday morning as he's filled the pulpit for us, and then also other opportunities that we've had for question and answer. We're looking forward to the final uh, times that he will be preaching during the month of February. But be in prayer over the decision that we're to make in the four weeks that are ahead of us. Let's pray. Father, I commit to you uh, our ministry this morning. We need your guidance and your direction. We pray for your blessing to be upon Gateway Church. We pray for your blessing to be upon RGF. And Father, as you have been indicating to many of us that you're seeking to lead these two congregations together, I pray that you would make the way plain. We commit this pathway to you. We pray, Father, that we would embrace the journey, no matter what befalls us, and that we would be willing to do our part to see that it is a successful one. And so, Father, we commit this time of decision to you. We pray that we would be led by your spirit. And we ask for your blessing this morning as we worship you and as we hear from your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. It's great to be back with you and sharing the Word of God. We've been taking a look at the story of the Exodus to see what we might learn in this new year with all of its challenges and all of its changes. And so we saw that in Exodus chapter 3, the Lord appeared to Moses in the burning bush and had a conversation with him and offered this incredible word of salvation. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I don't think there's any one of us that wouldn't want to be able to say of the Lord's relationship with us that he heard our cry, he saw our misery, and he has come down to help us. And Looking back on the cross of Calvary, that's exactly the testimony that each and every one of us who have put our trust in Christ have, that God has been a help to us. But we saw that God had a choice of leading them to war or leading them to the desert, so he took them through the desert, uh, and then eventually <clears throat> they came to the land. And last week we left you hanging. Uh, we talked about those stories at the end where it says to be continued, and that's exactly what was happening. And the majority of the people at the end of the story last week did not want to do what God had revealed to them. Rumors and opinions were flying. Moses and Aaron were praying. Joshua was standing up and pleading his case against the people, asking them not to rebel. And the people wanted a new leader, and they were ready to kill those that were in opposition to them and had any other way but to return to Egypt. And it says that when the whole assembly talked about stoning them and the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. And so we begin our story this morning by looking back just a little bit at the story. And so whenever we continue a story, we say previously at Gateway Church, speaking of the Exodus, we talked about embracing the journey. We spoke about that problem that people have. When they look at a problem, it says, looks good, but... There are giants in the land. There are always giants in the land. And God has told us that through His Spirit and by His might, we can defeat <clears throat> any enemy of the Lord. We can defeat any enemy of the church. And so be careful when you say, the plan looks good, but we need people of vision. And so it was that Joshua and Caleb were the men of vision that had come back and said, we can take this land, we can do it, because God is with us. But there were the rumors of men circulating, and in this day and troubled time, we find the rumors of men flying all over the place. There was also the problem of thinking the grass was greener on the other side of the fence. They looked back at what they had in Egypt and said, that's even better than what's in front of us in having to fight the giants that are in that land. But there were people of faith. Caleb was one who made his case that we need to go in. We can do this because God is with us. And so as we continue this story of embracing the journey that God has placed before us, and we as Gateway Church have a, a journey that God is asking us to walk down, we need to make a decision in the next month, four weeks from today, where we will be voting on whether to accept Pastor Caleb as our senior pastor and whether to merge with Redeeming Grace Fellowship. It is a decision that is of major consequence, and we need to have confidence that it's the Lord's leading in the direction that we're going, but we want to be able to embrace that journey. We want to be able to embrace the journey that God is leading us through with this pandemic, with all the social unrest that's going on in our nation, with the political divide and all that's happening. How do we embrace the journey of Christ with all of this, the transition, the pandemic, the unrest, all of it? How do we then fulfill the mission that God has given us to make fully devoted followers? Of Jesus Christ. And we're going to find some very sobering and some very serious and profound truths about this process of embracing the journey. And it's going to cause us, if we take the time, to really examine our hearts. And I plead with you to do that as we go through the message this morning because we don't do this often enough. The first thing that we're going to find from Numbers chapter 14 today is, is that we cannot and must not treat the Lord with contempt. Now you might say, well, I don't treat the Lord with contempt. I'm perhaps one of the finest people that God has ever saved. 
I really didn't need that much to begin with, but He's forgiven those sins that I've recognized. And we need to be so careful. I want you to hear what happened at this point in the story. Because the Lord speaks to Moses. Remember in our transition from last week, the people were in rebellion. They were thinking of stoning the leadership and replacing it with leadership that would take them back to slavery. And Moses saw the glory of God and all the people saw the glory of God descending down upon the tent of meeting where Moses would go and meet face to face with God. And it says that the Lord spoke to Moses. And so if you'd like to turn with me to please Numbers chapter 14 in your scriptures. And we're going to begin reading with verse 11. And in verse 11 it says, The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them. I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. God is saying to Moses that He was still going to use him to make a nation that would glorify him and to lead a nation that would glorify them. But as for the people that were rebelling, He was done with them. And have you ever thought to yourself that you've gotten to the place where you have grieved the heart of God, that you have treated Him with contempt, that you have not been willing to go to the place where He has asked you to go, not been willing to do the things that God has asked you to do? It's interesting that one of the things that has come from Pastor Caleb's messages from the book of Jonah is that it's all a story of a prophet of God that treated the Lord's commands with contempt. God said, go to Nineveh. And he refused to go. As a matter of fact, he ran the other way. And God has asked us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the illustrations and applications that Pastor Caleb has made is is how slow are we sometimes because of fear or for whatever reasons to speak the word of God and to speak the gospel of God. And we need to be careful that we do not treat the Lord with contempt when he's asked us to do something. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. And so the mission that we've embraced as a church, that we're to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Let's not treat the Lord with contempt. And the Lord would go on in this passage in verse 26 of Numbers chapter 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. And do you grumble? Do you complain? It's interesting that in the New Testament, when Paul wrote his letters to the new churches that he had planted all over Asia Minor, that he wrote to them about the need for unity, the need to bear with one another, the need to be careful that they do not grieve the Spirit of God. Listen to this from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Have you given any consideration at all to whether the sin in your life, to whether the complaints and the arguments of your life have grieved the Spirit of God and what He's trying to accomplish in the church in our day and in our time. I want to put this particular New Testament verse into its context because it gives gives us some very specific information about how you grieve the Spirit of God and what the antidote to that grieving is. In Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Listen to the handful of things that come out of this particular sentence. Watch the words that you speak. And what is motivating you to speak? Is it to make your point or is it to build others up? And will it benefit them? Will it help their needs? And will it be a blessing to those who listen? Some of us just talk, 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 talk. And it's all about us. And it's all about the information and the wisdom that we can pass out. And one of the problems that I've explained to you with the United States today is is that everybody thinks they're the only ones that see it all clearly. They're the only ones that have gotten it all right. They're the only ones that have the right perspective on the pandemic, the right perspective on social injustice, the right perspective on politics, the right perspective on child rearing, and on and on the list goes. But he says, watch the words you speak, because with your words you can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Are you building others up or are you tearing them down? 
It's this spirit that seals you for the day of redemption. He says in this passage, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now just listen to these words and place it over what is happening in our story in the Exodus. The people were grumbling and complaining. The people were complaining against God. They were complaining against Moses and Joshua and Caleb and Aaron. They didn't like their leadership. They wanted new leadership. They were grumbling and they were complaining. Was there any kindness? Was there any compassion? Was there any forgiveness of others? Were they getting rid of bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander? I've been to some church meetings where I've seen anger rise up in people that are in the church. And it's not to have any place there because this kind of thing grieves the Spirit of God. And all that when people come through the doors, what they would see is kindness and compassion for one another. We need to be a people that are able to forgive one another because we will sin against one another. And God has asked us to have the same attitude towards others that he has toward us. That as he has forgiven us, we would forgive them. It's interesting, an article that I read just this week in World Magazine from World News Group, it was entitled 2020's Church Divide. And in this article, it talks about the effects that the pandemic has had on the church and politics and social unrest, but it, con or it concentrates mostly on the pandemic. And it says this in the article, that adding to the dynamic is the fact that usual modes of discipleship and fellowship, meeting in person, reading facial expressions and body language, touching each other, singing and laughing together, they're gone. No seminary courses prepare pastors for deciding whether to close their churches, when to open, which ministry to cut or how to care for the sick from six feet away, or I might add, from even farther away when you're not allowed to go into the hospital. Some churches have fired their pastors over their decisions on the pandemic, the article writes. Many pastors have lost church members, spent hours explaining their decisions to an offended party, or lost track of who's stopped engaging and who's fallen through the cracks. One couple in California doesn't think their church takes the coronavirus serious enough. One family in Texas left because they thought their church restricted too much. Many churches have families from both sides of the spectrum in their congregations. And pastors feel like they're twisted into pretzels, trying to minister to both. It's like trying to nail jello to a tree, one pastor told me. No matter what they decide, somebody's mad. Pastors are wearing themselves out trying to manage other people's emotions. And so, whether it's the pandemic or whether it's social unrest or whether it's just the day-to-day -day functions of the church, are you treating the Lord and His mission with contempt? Or have you embraced the journey so that you're willing to say with others, I'm going to do whatever I have to do in order to accomplish the mission with the people that God has gathered around me? The second thing that we learn from this story is, is that we need to intercede for others. One of the beautiful things is, is that what we find in this story is, is Moses and Aaron were on their face before the Lord. And when the glory of the Lord appeared to the tent of meeting, Moses went out as he regularly did, and he met with the Lord face to face. And so it is that Moses said to the Lord, if you do this, what you're saying, if you do not bring this people into the land and you bring a plague among us, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from them. In accordance with your great love, Moses says to God, forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Moses knew about the ongoing work of forgiveness in the lives of the nation of Israel. He knew about it in his own life. And the people of God need to be so confronted and so impressed with God's forgiveness of them that it's their desire for everyone else to be a forgiven people. And so when there's conflict among you, whether it be in your family, whether it be on the job, whether it be in the church of Jesus Christ, if sin has entered into the picture and there's people that have sinned against you, is it your desire that God would forgive them and you would forgive them and then we're going to move on from here? And so it is that Moses used his place as a leader when he could have gone to God and gotten on his knees and said, God, what kind of people did you give me to lead out of Egypt and into this promised land? They do nothing but grumble and complain. 
They do nothing but cause strife among them. And now they want to go back. And they don't want to go where you want them to go. But Moses is on his knees face to face with God saying, in accordance with your great love, forgive the sin of these people. We need a church of intercessors. We need a church that's willing to pray for our nation and intercede for our nation. We need a church of people that's willing to pray for the church of Jesus Christ. We need a, a gathering of people that are willing to pray for Gateway Church, willing to pray for Redeeming Grace Church, pray for the merger, pray for all that's going on. In accordance with your great love, O oh God, would you forgive us this day? Our nation needs your forgiveness desperately. Intercede for others. And when it comes to your words before God and when it comes to your actions, you need to be filled with the grace of God. And God's grace needs to cover everything that you do. And so in the middle of Moses' prayer in Numbers chapter 14 in his discussion with God, he says in verse 17, Now may the Lord's strength be displayed, just as you have declared. And you might say, well, now what is the Lord's strength? We ask God to do all kinds of things. And in the name of Jesus, we want His power to be displayed. But do you not realize that in the name of Jesus, His power was displayed on the cross and what was that message? That message was one of grace and that message was one of love. And so he says to the Lord in his discussion with him, now may the Lord's strength be displayed. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. In accordance with your great love, Forgive the sin of these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. Are you willing to let this message of grace surround all that you do? Are you willing to let the grace of God and what He's done in Jesus Christ affect the way that you look at other people and the goals and the motivations that you have for everything that you do, everything that you say to them, everything that you speak? When you walk into church on Sunday morning, do you have stories that you want to tell because they look, make you look good? Or have you ever come through the doors of the church and said, my goal this morning is that I might allow others to be built up in Jesus Christ. My goal when I pray is that others would be built up in Jesus Christ. My goal in the church of Jesus Christ is that others might know this story of redemption. That they might own it and they might join us on the journey. We need to let God's grace fill us and we need to let it affect everything that we do. I love the second verse of that song that we sing, Take Us to the River. It says, Take Us to the Mountain, referring to that image in the Old Testament that when God went and met with the Lord face to face. Because that mountain is symbolic of the mercy of God reaching out to mankind. And we need to go to the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 12 it says that when you run this race of life, the Christian life that's set out and marked out for you, you need to run it with endurance and you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the one that went before us. And that race led Him to the cross and no matter where the journey of God takes us, whether it be on a smooth and straight road or whether it's through the most difficult road that we've ever walked and ever traveled, may the Lord's strength be displayed in us, the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus Christ. Let God's grace fill you and affect everything that you do. We also need in our lives to acknowledge the discipline of the Lord. The children of Israel in the Exodus had troubled God greatly. And I want you to hear the words of the Lord in response to the intercession of Moses. In Numbers chapter 14, verse 20, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory in the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Have you ever stopped in your Christian life and wondered if you, that you haven't received something of the blessing of God because of sin in your life or because of the sin around us? is so great that God is troubled by the sin of the church, troubled by the sin of you as an individual.
Have you ever, and that, we talked a lot in Pastor Kayla's messages about the need for repentance. We saw that in Luke chapter 15 in the story of all the lost ones. The need for repentance and the joy it brings in heaven. We saw from Jonah the need for repentance and that he cried out that salvation belongs to God. But we need to acknowledge the discipline of the Lord. The Lord says, I have forgiven them, but yet they will not enter. And we need to be willing to say, God, even if you withhold any blessing other than the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, I will still be faithful to you because I realize the sinfulness of my heart makes me unworthy of all that you've given me. God does discipline his people and he disciplined the nation of Israel and so it is that not one of them other than those that had proven faithful would enter that land. And so we get to the place now where we challenge you to be the faithful one. And it's interesting that he says this, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. He goes on in this passage to talk about the fact that I will also allow Joshua to go into that land because he was willing to trust me and he had a different spirit and would follow God wholeheartedly. And so what we find here is, is if you want to be the faithful one before God, are you willing to follow the Lord wholeheartedly with all that you are and then enter into the blessings that God has for you? We need to be the faithful one. And then finally we find in this passage that if you're going to embrace the journey, it involves obeying God's word. And here's one of the most troubling things about the people of Israel with their desire to follow God and to do it their way. All throughout the land, they wanted to be able to create God in their image. And we saw that with the golden calf. They wanted God to lead them in their way. And so they wanted to be directed in any way. And they didn't want to fight the giants in the land, so they turned back. And we have a problem where in America we're doing the same things. We believe that we're so independent, we believe that we're so smart and intelligent that we can create a God in our own image that's better than any God that has revealed himself in the scripture. And that's one of the most dangerous things that you could ever possibly do. And so God pronounced this judgment on him and the people still were not willing to obey him. God said, since the Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back to Mar and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. God said, I have forgiven them and I will not send them into the promised land, but I will still protect them. But I want you to go back to the desert for a season. I want you to go back to the desert for a generation. I want you to go back toward the nation of Israel. But the people that had been groaning and the people that had been complaining and the people that wanted to replace their leadership and the people that shook their face their fists in the face of God and said, we don't want to go the direction that you want us to go, now all of a sudden said, no, Lord, we're going to go into the land. And in rebellion against this prophetic word from God, they went up and marched against the armies of the Amalekites and the Canaanites, and they were bitterly and miserably defeated. We need to be those that obey God's word. And so this is the story that we leave before you in its conclusion if we're going to embrace the journey that God has given to us, we need to recognize that there are giants in the land, but he's given us the strength and the ability and the power to defeat them all. Do not treat the Lord with contempt. Do not live your life in such a way that your sinfulness rises up before him and bothers the Lord in his righteousness and his holiness. Don't let your rebellion rise up and bring division to the church of Jesus Christ. Instead, make yourself out to be like Moses and Aaron who fall on your face in difficult times and plead with the Lord for his kindness and his goodness and his grace to be shown one more time. Don't get so upset with all that you see in the world, politically and socially and in the church of Jesus Christ that you're ready to run or you're ready to be angry or you're ready to do anything else. Be one who intercedes for others. Let the prayer life of this church rise up before God because he's willing to meet us in prayer. He's the one who told us that we need to come boldly into his throne room. Let God's grace fill you and let it move you in the way that you think about others. 
Let God's grace motivate the way that you pray for others, the way that you speak to others, the way that you act toward others. And when God does have to discipline you, acknowledge the discipline of the Lord. It's interesting, I remember way back to 9-11, a couple of preachers suggested that it was the discipline of God on America, and nobody wanted to hear of it. And when the pandemic struck, some preachers would rise up and said that this may be the hand of God's discipline upon a nation that has gone so far astray from God. No one wanted to hear of it. Don't be a people that believe that God doesn't discipline anyone anymore. Like a loving father, he cares for you. And we need to acknowledge the discipline of the Lord. But you respond to it by being the faithful one. Being the one who wasn't led into disobedience to begin with because you believe God's way is right. His law is right. His word is right. His commands are right. And you need to obey God's word. I'm hoping that as we head into this month of decision, that as we head into this month of pandemic with all of its uncertainties, as we head into this season where we want our Christian life to be better than it's ever been before, that we will embrace the journey that God has given us to walk, that we're willing to help others around us slay the giants that are in the land and we believe that God can do it, that the gates of hell will fall before us. Be a people of prayer and intercede for others. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this challenge from the Word of God. And Lord, may we learn from the people of Israel to have hearts like Joshua and Caleb, to have a prayer life like Moses who was called a man of humility that fell down on his face before you and asked for your grace to be shown for others. I pray, Father, that you would show your grace to a new generation. I pray that we would be not so bothered by all the sin around us that we forget that it was your forgiveness that made us approved in your sight and your forgiveness alone. May the shed blood of Jesus Christ wash another generation clean. May we be yielded to you today. And Father, when your discipline comes, may we receive it. But Father, I pray that we would be the righteous ones that would stand up and call for obedience to your word. We ask for your blessing and your help this day as we walk humbly before you. In Jesus' name, amen.
temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. 